It is an absolute honour to share this panel with Me Too Asians, Asian Voices Europe and Shiorito. It's been months in the making for us to work out a way to choose the most comfortable and safe setting to have such a vital conversation. Asian Voices Europe are a non-profit working on promoting Asian diversity with a focus on facilitating dialogue on anti-Asian racism and discrimination in the region. Its current projects include creating a guideline on dealing with discrimination at the workplace, a survey on Asians' experience of discrimination, and creating an archive of racist incidents in Europe. They are represented here today by Jie Shang, one of the co-founders of Asian Voices Europe. They are also the North Korea Projects Manager at the Human Rights Foundation and a freelance interpreter and translator. In her master's degree, Jie researched online feminist activism in South Korea, findings of which can be found at outlets such as BBC Asia and Korea Expose. Me Too Asians are a non-profit organisation in Germany that focus on the internal community aspect of resource building. They hold therapy and community sharing sessions and workshops for survivors of sexual assault and help victims file lawsuits. They are represented here today by Lily Shim, one of the board members of Me Too Asians. In 2021, she worked on the short documentary project Our Stories, Our Voices to find out a definition of anti-Asian racism via qualitative interviews with Asian women talking about their experiences with racism and sexism in Germany. She also works as a member of AG Trostfrauen in a voluntary way, and in her master's thesis, she analysed the institutional influences on the gender pay gap, comparing Germany and South Korea. We are so happy that we'll be having this conversation today. This panel, as well as looking at the ways that we have, can affect change and alternative forms of process, will inquire further into protests. Protest comes in many forms, not always in the ways that we have come to expect, from the dissemination of information around sexual violence and misconduct, to an unveiling of how fields such as journalism can improve their practice. This panel will also touch on the different types of protest within the Me Too Asian movement. I will be speaking with these people on behalf of Tilted Access Press, a feminist press with a radical and intersectional tilt. And my name is Tija Jin. I'm a writer and community activist. And um, let him, you know, the world know what's going on, which is something like, you know, we had uh, uh, almost over 110 years of rape law before, and we changed it in 2017. Um, after many women voiced up, but um, actually still in Japan to um, define rape in the law, the victim has to show how much um, the one has been threatened or violated. So there's no um, line about consent. So in my case, um, a few days ago, I just won the the high court ruling, and it was second round for my own sexual violence experience um, case. But um, the the civil it was in civil court, and they they ruled that there was no consent. Um, but still, in Japanese criminal system, because of our current law, it doesn't protect or it doesn't define it as a sexual violence so even they know that it, there was no consent so um after seeing how word has changed especially after you know me to movement in 2017 i felt that we can push more so we can you know um really raise the point that how backward our Japanese legal system is, but still, um, there is a huge gap, I think, in between the reality and the, these lawmakers 
and it's 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 frustrating because you know no matter how many times we raise our boys no matter now i feel in media you know before i spoke out i felt media was so you know not happy about covering these cases because in japanese society you know um sexual violence is still taboo topic to talk about and they put stigma on um survivors so now i feel it's changing um so you know what's going on you know how the law isn't working but still it's not moving so i i don't know how to answer this um i you know we have to keep up our hope and never you know silence ourselves and just really highlight what we need to change but unless these lawmaker wouldn't really make a move it doesn't change so it's i would love to know how you guys are dealing with this because yeah i i feel like i'm facing to the wall right now and i know um in our um um we we are still in discussion of changing it so it could happen but it's taking just too long it's it's taking such a long time and it's not changing it so i would love to actually hear from any of you if you know you have any better way i mean i think you know starting point we share a lot of similarity with south korea and japan in terms of um criminal justice system but south korea took so much step forward before we had any chance to change it so i'd love to yeah hear something from outside because i think mm. we need help we need um some idea what else we can do as uh, you know through these through international community yeah i would i'm really curious about where gia or what you what you might think about um the ways that we can interact with the law and enact that type of change yeah so one of the problems we face when we started our research on anti asia hate in europe back in march mm -hmm. 2020 was that anti asian hate is not classified as a category of police records so at the european union level for example there is a separate category for anti roma crimes anti black crimes anti semitic crimes but there is no separate category for anti asian crimes so they are probably reported in the general category of xenophobia and discrimination, which uh, when we look further into it, for instance, the anti-Roma discrimination um, working group was created because a member of the European Parliament who is of Roma descent led this movement. Mm. So one of the issues is that we don't have Asian descendant politicians or politicians working on behalf of Asian interests voicing this problem. So it's always... Um, as you said, Shuri, it comes down to like people leading that change and that is a burden and a lot of work and a long battle, but it seems like that is the only way that we will have our interests reflected in this long battle. Mm. And as, uh, it's, it shows so much, that, you know, when we come up against the bulwark, you know, facing someone who's not sympathetic to the issue and uh, they have managed to ex exist outside of it through their whole career. And it seems to be that those are the people that we um, are, are forced to plead to the most in order to see some type of change through. And, but it does, I think today feels quite positive in that regards, just how many change makers are in the room. And, um, and these conversations seem like some of the healthier starting places. Um, did you have any thoughts on that, Lily? Yeah, um, I also want to add one more thing. Like Hiori also talked a little bit of like difference between Japan and Korea. Yeah, there are also a lot of similarity in terms of this like a legal difficulties for like to sue and to uh, achieve the justice of the victims of 
violation of the harassment. Uh, yeah, in Korea, I think it's more like uh, it's perceived as sexual violence, and they're all persecuted. But the problem is the the how I say like the degree of the punishment that receive uh, the um, the persecutor received. It's just really insanely low and light. So I think it's also one of the problems that we are facing. How we can change this uh, penalty for all these persecutors. Mm. Yeah. So yeah, there is still a long way to go. <laughs> so, um, but people needing the change, and then also changing the penalty for those who do cross those boundaries. Um, One thing I realized is that uh, now, as you know, as we can have Zoom meeting or you know event like this, it's easier to talk from outside of where we are from. And, you know, before Me Too happened, I felt like, you know, talking about sexual violence, talking about, you know, legal change was just, didn't go anywhere. And I still remember today that New York Times covered my story. And, and then Japanese main, you know, mainstream newspaper covered, that according to news, New York Times, this is happening. So they sort of, you know, re-imported the story. Mm -hmm. And that's how difficult it was. So, you know, we do have no way to, you know, um, way to do it, talking from outside. And now one thing I really want to do is that this year, our age of, um, how, do you, how do you call it in English? How Our age of uh, official adult age will, will come down from 20 years old to 18. So from this year, 18 years old can vote which is so exciting and how, you know, finally it's happening. But the age of consent in Japan still remains 13 years old. And we don't have any consent education. We don't have any, you know, consent in our sexual violence law. So which means that uh, they assume after you turn to 13 years old, you know what what's the sex is and you know, you know, what the consent is, meaning you can be mother, but you can't get married until 18 years old. I mean, sorry, be, till, it's going to change in April, but before, women could marry when she's 13, 16, and men could marry when he's 18. So there were two-year um, gap. So finally, it, the gap will be no longer exists, but there is a gap of 13 years old to 18 years. So, you know, the socially it's it's so questionable but one hand something it's you know start changing boarding age the other hand it's not so hopefully people realize quickly how no you know how it how it's not working today you know we are not anymore any longer the day we created our sexual violence law when women didn't have voting rights in japan you know 110 years ago so Hopefully that could be highlighted. And Korea successfully did raise the consent of age. Cheers for that. And ho really, hopefully it's going to happen soon in Japan. I mean, 13. Yeah. yeah. It's and it's, it's this thing, this, this bridge between um, the social areas of like, uh, that we know are wrong socially, but the legal system is so out of odds with it. And um, it, it does feel like... Uh, especially recently that that bridge is starting to be um, made smaller and um, crossed. <laughs> I wanted to pose a question to the group. Um, so what organisations do you feel are most exciting at the moment with the solidarity work that they're doing? Um, as a, today is a resource sharing uh, hour as well, uh, maybe we'll be putting some people onto some great work. Do you have um, any particular favorites um, for Lily, uh, Gia, or Siori? For me, I nothing just come up. Sorry, right now, but just give me some time, and I'd love to hear from you guys. Sorry. <laughs> this is a very big question, TJ. <laughs> yeah, whether you have any like uh, other charities that you enjoy the work that they're doing. Well, I'm personally a very big fan of Me Too Asians because I think their work is really innovative. And I don't know of other organizations in at least Central Europe 
who are specifically focusing on helping Asian women victims of sexual violence. Um, so I hope their work can also be expanded to help women in other countries. Mm. I, I agree. I think it's, it can, it's remarkable actually how um, these borders can be crossed with activism and sometimes it can be an ideological seed that gets planted in one country that blooms in another. Um, as like a, a curveball of sorts, um, I, I would say for myself, Gantala Press, they are a feminist press in the Philippines and the way that I see their activism is just in the fact that they platform and raise voices from people of all different backgrounds, um, workers, people who are not writers, but they're being published for um, a range of different forms. So I really recommend looking into their work and sometimes they'll um, publish like a book of recipes from somebody and through the recipes it will be a way of understanding their experience um, and it's not just necessarily publishing someone's poetry or, or a novel or, um, or a book of essays and I think that's really important as well just that information is uh, shared in as many diverse and on this on the spot way as is possible. Can you share their name in the chat? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. I think it's so important that um, as um, in Japan we do have written we, we do have constitution saying that uh, you know gender should be equal and you know human rights is in, I mean individual rights is important, but it's 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 not protecting us you know how you know all our uh, criminal lawyers so it's not really acting it's not really practiced the constitution in japan and i feel like in asia human rights you know we don't have such organization like eu and that it's really um when when i realized that there is no way to go but you know uh being a process of only in Japanese legal um, system when I'm trying to fight against or trying to seek justice, it was devastating. So, you know, having that, you know, wise talk from outside and really mm. try to find a way to only we can, what we can do is really um, speak up from out, not only, but, you know, uh, trying to put other way of legal system outside of, you know, Asia and see why we need it and how it's you know not working here it's so important so yeah N yeah now so great um asian boys europe is my favorite organization now well thank you <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> and it is yeah. amazing i think um sometimes um when and i think it comes down to the digitization of things as well just um like you were saying, the, the way that um, more organizations work have uh, discoverability now that we are sharing Zoom calls in a way that's more um, accessible than before. I think before when we used to see um, an online event, it would be like one a year, or it would be so much smaller. Um, not one a year, but the, that's, that's hyperbolic, but we definitely um, were not having new conversations as quickly. And um, uh, Siori, with your work, it's very, um, you um, are often perceived as a public figure standing alone. Um, do you have any organizations in Japan that you find particularly supportive towards your activism or, or outside of Japan? Mm. I, I think first I had a trouble finding one and um, when I spoke out, I got reached out from UK based organization and then decided to relocate myself so I can get some, you know, support and protection when I was in the middle of threats and um, mm -hmm. online abuse after speaking now about my experience. And um, um, there, there are great individuals, but I think as an organization, um, there are not maybe many, um, unfortunately, and um, 
I don't know how to explain this, but um, in Japan, I think he, historically we didn't have any successful social activism movement, mm. and um, um, we finally had small like um, um, really um, silent but public. Um, um, standing protest called flower de de demo demonstration and that was um, how people gather have the you know their favorite flower in their hand and really try to show we we want to make create safe space to speak about anyone's you know experience and um we gotta you know find a quicker way to change the law and just to show the solidarity in a nice way. But I never seen any angry protests or any anything happening on the street. So, you know, I see a lot that a lot of that and and happening in Seoul and outside of, you know, Japan, but you know, in Asia. And that's when I feel like what are we missing? <laughs> you know, we 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 I think we are really good at I don't know. Um people really bury you. I think it's maybe one of our way to live, but the patience. And if you don't speak, that's, we can have harmonious life. And we know that that's not creating any harmony at all now. It's not working, but so activism, having that kind of organization based in Japan is very tough. Mm -hmm. And that is why I think it's sometimes needed to have some international solidarity and also Japanese language. Mm. Oh, do, does anyone speak Japanese? It's like when I speak Japanese, there is high lucky. Like I have to use really polite way to speak, and by using the language, it's really hard to have like that kind of organization. And I that's something I have trouble with to speak with my you know uh re, yeah one of some of respectful Japanese feminists because. I feel like there we should talk like this, but then there is always like, uh, yeah, the kind of way of Sideways. speaking. Yeah, so it's really a lot come come down to our how we speak our language as well. That's not working, and I don't know how to change that. So I'm really trying to find a way to communicate openly. It just goes to show so much of our. Um... Um, meeting with groups is is on how we communicate with each other and, uh, and that affects the pace of the change that we make. Um, before we move on to the next question, does anyone have any thoughts on that? Uh, actually, I want to add one more thing. I mean, as a mediation, we are open to just cooperation with other organizations in general. Uh, we also did like cooperative action with the uh, Asian Voices Europe. Um, to uh, make uh, produce this like guidebook uh, to uh, like fight against racism in Europe in general, but uh, from this year we are actually planning to have various events in regard to digital uh, sexual crime. So it has like I think it has been like three years in Korea that it was it became as a really serious problem. So if you guys know any organization working um, to raise awareness of the seriousness of this digital sexual crime and also uh, to support the victims, we would like to <laughs> work with them. <laughs> Um, somebody just uh, recommended Femi Zemi in Japan, a collective of queer feminist studies scholars who run courses targeting young people so they can learn about gender, sexuality, queer politics and more. And uh, they sound really amazing. And, that sounds amazing. Um, Thank I've you had, for sharing. I, th I, think, I think that's beautiful that we're, we're starting to learn more through this group mm -hmm. chat function as well. I also recommend English Pen. They're an international charity based in, um, they have centers in, in various countries and they exist to support writers at risk and especially those mm. who um, are uh, being challenged based on their views. And uh, I work with them. I've got, I've got a t-shirt on today. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I think sometimes uh, particular community hubs can then also suggest more organizations that um, operate at a more quiet level 
and and some of the reasons why we don't necessarily know the names of all these organizations is because it works for them to have a, a low profile in some to some extent oh there's a uh, someone's also said in japan there are now one-stop centers for people who experience sexual violence in each prefecture and they shared the website for that um i'm going yes. to um, move on to the next question now, but please feel free to keep um, adding organisations in a, in a gentle and mindful way into the chat. Um, I want to ask you guys, what do you feel is the best way to share resources for community justice? Yeah, I'm going to say that the best way is that we start talking amongst ourselves because yeah, like for example, I got to know Meet Asians, I think like during the pandemic when I was starting to do research for Asian Voices Europe. And when we started getting reports of racist incidents, we also got incidents of sex um, crimes that were committed against Asian women. And I wanted to ask them for their advice. And that's how we got to know each other and started collaborating because so many issues related to discrimination are obviously intersectional so it's like so many layers and often yeah, especially with racism it's also sexism that's heavily influential so we just need to yeah i think we just need to get to know each other and to see to make sure we're not doing overlapping work and if we are doing overlapping work how can we both both collaborate since we're often very small uh groups Yeah, definitely. And on uh, to add on to Jia's idea, I think it's also quite important to publish the the problem that we have, we have like the, what's going on in the society as much as as possible. I mean, uh, I mean, you know, this is also because the more people know about what's going on and understand uh, about it, then the easier it is to I mean, it is uh, to raise our voices. I mean, yeah, it sounds a little bit cliche, but I think that's what it is. And um, what I meant with the content here is like the societal problem that uh, came with uh, the patriarchy and also sex and racism and colonialism and etc so i think uh, it can be also done through like social media like newspapers even or or like a writing book like theory and also even like these public workshops there that we are doing right now so i think it's also really important to publish and show the other groups of the society yeah that's so true you know i wrote my book um in 2017 around i published around when me to movement was happening at the same time and i really didn't expect that i could reach to you guys and you know publish it in english back then and um i think what helped me as a survivor is that uh i didn't have to i mean i mean i've been talking about over and over but I said it there and I, it's, it's reaching automatically in different languages and that's beautiful. And so that we, you know, we had this chance to have this event to be connected. So, um, I think, yeah, as writing and for me as a storyteller, I think, you know, for, uh, my profession is also doc making documentary film as well. So that's what I'm want to focus as well, because I think every, social problem includes you know individual story and we have to somehow have a, that perspective to see it um so yeah thank you so much for you know <laughs> this event really because um also for me it helps to speak this in english which is you know not my mother tongue but um to really um express what we need in japan and you know be heard and just hear you um what you say what you have to say so that i i get energy uh, especially now in pandemic i haven't been staying in japan this long and i'm being struggling how to communicate how to you know um highlight this issue when i connect you know communicate pers in person in outside of japan because that's i think how i was you know balancing myself so yeah I'm so happy. I know we are in different time and I know some of you are maybe having coffee 
Um, I have to say that I'm actually having wine because it's 9 p.m. in Japan, but I'm very happy that we're still. Hi! <laughs> but uh, I'm very happy that I'm um, doing this. Yeah, um, it's possible now. So that's so inspiring to hear because I think, um, and, and this is the question I'll be going on to soon, but just this is how we show solidarity through communion and. Uh, um, you have one, I'll be having one later, thinking of you having one this morning, do you know what I mean? It's, uh, we, we're sharing experience and talking and feeling comfortable with each other. And uh, I, so I wanted to ask, um, how can we as a community better protect each other? Does anyone, uh, has anyone had an example of how they felt protected by the community before? Or um, any suggestions for what we could do? Some uh, some examples that draw to my mind closely is also um, working out how to um, mindfully share a social media of accounting of something. So, for example, somebody attending this event, um, when we are circulating information about what it was that we took in, to just make sure that we are not paraphrasing people, make, making sure we be using people's words how, as they were expressed rather than changing their words and things like this are really important because sometimes things can be misconstrued and that's one type of uh, digital solidarity that i've been thinking about a lot recently so preserving people's words and uh, sharing them as they were intended that's so true um i think as I said, in Japan, maybe there is no significant like visual um, movement happen. I don't think we had a Me Too movement. It wasn't movement, but I think, it, on, you know, people were so um, supportive online. Of course, we, I had, I've been facing, um, you know, other um, side as well. But at the same time, I think in the beginning, I saw so many more negative comments, but after Me Too movement, I got more positive comments as well. So I've been always telling people that um, I don't have a sixth sense. So many people who I, I meet, they're like, I've been you know, supporting you from my heart. And I'm like, thank you, but I can't see that. I can't read it. I can, you know, I don't have a sixth sense. So say it. And if you can't say it, it can be anonymous. But you know, if you see any negative comments, um, please say something nice with love. Because I realize even that these words were attacking me personally, it's going to affect other survivors as well. And I thought I can just ignore it because, you know, maybe it's just for my own sake, but it wasn't like that. And online, it's not like I can just, you know, rip up these posters on the street. It's going to stay for a long time. And we got to do something about it. So, yeah, I think really, um, you know, um, showing the support um, is r really important. And it's, it's, it has been helping me, um, even I don't hear it in person. I think voicing that support is so important, like you just said, because, yeah, we need to be able to hear those things out loud and to know that our work is being seen by other people and it's maybe helping them in one way or another or inspiring them to take action themselves because, yeah, we cannot sense this with this sixth sense. And in a way, I think that's where cultural plays a very big part because in many East Asian countries, especially, we're taught to just you know, keep quiet and then, you know, don't talk about sensitive topics. You don't know what the other person is feeling. But yeah, I don't know what the other person is feeling, but I also don't know if they're thinking the same thing, also not saying things. So what I've observed at my paid job at the Human Rights Foundation, for example, is that um, North Korean women activists often will communicate among themselves in English. And it also kind of, I think, enables them to be clear about how they appreciate each other's work or how they think about each other's work. Because also in Korean, there's this hierarchy in language. Mm -hmm. And yeah, in English, they don't have that problem. So also it's more comfortable for them to speak to me in English because then they don't feel 
maybe that I have more power because I'm working at an organization whereas they're an individual. And yeah, I think for language, it's just such a big part of how we can protect each other and how we show appreciation for each other with just yeah, some, yeah, some attention. Yeah, definitely. And I also want to add one more, uh, and I mean, another aspect. I think it's also important to hear uh, from the other marginalized group. Uh, for example, like I think uh, in Japan, in Korea, in, in Europe as well, there are also other, like, or even more, uh, like a precarious, the people in the more precarious situations. I think it's also important to hear that, hear from them. And, uh, you know, what we want is not just a safe place for only for Asian or only for the women in our community, but also, I mean, we need a safe place for all of us. So I think in, or, in order to protect us from this structural injustice, I think it's also really important that we need to actively learn and include other marginalized group uh, of people so that in a long run, we can actually protect each other <laughs> and even in a bigger uh, way, so to say. Um, yeah, that's really important. I think, and even sometimes people don't know necessarily that um, one community has openness to reach out and support another. And it's, uh, it's something as simple as saying, we're here and the doors are open. That can begin that. So um, I, I think I might move on to our audience questions now if everybody's ready. We were sent one that was really interesting and it was um, in relation to um, gender and conversations around women's rights. But um, how can we avoid the pitfalls of other women's organizations and lobby movements who are often trans exclusive? Um, I think some of this is as important um, as looking at language and the way that we um, have gender inclusive language. And if, um, if we're preparing marketing copy for an event, that we make sure that we're getting it right and we're bringing it back to the individuals that are involved in the event and that we're presenting them as they are and as they wish to be seen. So, like we were saying earlier with, um, say, the hierarchical na nature of Japanese and um, the way that various languages have these codes and how we express things, it's um, important to really find loopholes in order to have the most inclusive way of expressing things as possible. Does anyone else have any thoughts on that? Uh, well, I have something that's not exactly in this line, but it's something along the similar uh, line at Asian Voices Europe. And the question we faced when we were setting out the organization in March 2020 was, how will we define Asian? Because that can also be very exclusive. Often Asian is used to only denote China, Korea, and Japan, or like the more known or like more hip, trendy kind of Asian countries that we see a lot in the media. So I think we discussed it actually for about half a year of how will we um, define Asia because that also has political implications. If we, like for example, how are we going to address the issue of Hong Kong and Taiwan and Tibet? Because that might mean our audience who is pro mainland China will not support our movement. Um, and that's something that we're still dealing with and struggling with a little bit because we don't want to um, exclude people but yeah by making a choice for example to not comment something you are also making a statement so we made the decision in our survey for example to include ethnic ethnographic data um, and we said yeah if you are do you identify as east asian and we included hong kong so that was a decision that we made because we believe that was correct. Um, but yeah, I think it can be similar in other terminologies. Like we would refrain from saying, uh, 
or women or men, women and men who have experienced violence, but we would try to go for people who have experienced racism or to use more neutral language because yeah, we were very lucky to have very diverse perspectives in our group from quite early on. So I think the important thing to not be exclusive is to keep asking yourself questions and your group questions about whether you are improving your inclusivity. Keep asking yourself questions. Uh, I love that. Um, and uh, we, we and in the chat, uh, Nina is saying we should also make sure that trans women, trans and non-binary people, especially migrants, should be centred as they experience uh, more oppression in some places, less access to resources. Um, yeah, I I agree with that. I think it's really important. Um, and um, as they're saying, not an afterthought. I, um, we have another question from an audience that sent in advance. Um, how do you balance your activism and self-care? We have to be good to ourselves, huh? So. <laughs> yeah, I think it, it's a good time to hear from you, but for me, um, I eat spicy stuff, so I had my secret, can I say that? I, I uh, yeah, I had secret recordings while I was investigating my own case, and every time end of secret recording, now I'm transcribing, I hear myself eating hot stuff with my friends, like, my friends like, oh my gosh, you're gonna kill myself, I'm like, what a, you know, I don't care, I am just need this spiciness right now, and somehow spice have been making me not too depressed and just like it's been fueling you know being my huge um power to move on and also while i loved to hear everyone every most of my good friend told me or people told me after i had to deal with um difficult cases they said let's go grab your favorite food or let's go eat this ramen place i just found and just not you know exactly telling me what was going on but just really showing we are here to share something and for me yeah sharing food has, has such a big way to share our love and you know um way to do it and i do a lot of yoga so whenever i do go on press conference i need a little little space for yoga mat, I don't even have a yoga mat, but you know, where I can do my, you know, practice before, so I can focus on my, you know, because it's, it's a lot to deal with. And um, I don't actually know yet how to balance myself. So at night I have wine and my cat next to me, and that's how I've been balancing. And I don't think it's a great example, so I would love to hear, but you know, this is great that's way lovely, to, though balance to to be connected to hear you know and to see you and i'm just let me say i'm happy to see some of your face because every time when this kind of event happen i don't see you and i feel like i'm just speaking to i don't know who so thank you so much um nina and and there i i love to see faces so and thank you so much for everyone else to join us because i know it's um, it's really important for us to share this time, even even we don't have you know direct conversation at this moment. So thank you so much. It does come down to that, doesn't it? Seeing each other, being with each other, sharing. Um, my cat mm -hmm. is next to me too. <laughs> <laughs> I think cats are the solution. I also have a cat here. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Yeah, I think, um, so actually, I think I asked that question because I wanted to hear from Shuri and it's always a balancing act to find, um, define your boundaries of how much you want to dedicate yourself to activism because I think often you want to do more, you want to change more things, you want to do more things, which is uh, why I have sprained my wrist because I'm overworking, so I can't really speak. But what I found is very helpful through my paid job working with human rights activists in countries like North Korea or Cuba or Venezuela is that they need to separate their work from their personal life. Mm -hmm. And the most 
simple way to do it is by having separate phones or by having separate laptops that you turn yourself off, which is why I have two phones and I have another one on the way because I want to just um, physically separate those boundaries. Um, and yeah, it's not always possible because sometimes I'm with my personal phone and I'm also thinking about work. But yeah, I think for activists, self-care is important because um, in the humanitarian sector, statistics say approximately a third of all humanitarian workers experience burnout or depression or even alcoholism. So to be sustainable in a movement, you need to put yourself first because if you are not well, you cannot help anybody else, says somebody who is overworking. <laughs> You are not well, you can't of anyone else. Mm. Such. We have to look after ourselves, it's true. Um, Lily, did you have any? Yeah. The spicy food, I also agree. It's very <laughs> Spicy food, cats, two phones. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, this is the question that I'm asking myself for like, yeah, a long time. I mean, yeah, uh, last year was really tough for me, for me because I had so many projects going on. And yeah, it's, you're right, Jie, that it's just really hard to uh, separate uh, this activism and my own uh, personal life. And I don't know how did I uh, actually handle it, uh, but yeah, I mean, but I think it's also important to be uh, also, I mean, also talking about these issues with uh, like a member, like for example, for me was uh, the member from the Asian, I talk about this like more personally, and then they also understand me, then understand me, then it just made me a little bit more like encouraged and uh, somehow it was also uh, somehow like a way of caring myself and even though I'm still talking about the same issue but somehow I feel like ah they're also they understand me and then uh, since like um, yeah it just made me really like release and somehow yeah <laughs> I don't know how to put this in the good word but yeah it just yeah I can know <laughs> I love that no. So um, before we go on to our final question, I had one more from the audience um, and we've got about three minutes to think about this, but, but how can we work transculturally and intersectionally and form strong bonds with other organisations? So, well, that looks like a good book. Someone just mentioned a book called Pleasure Activism in the group chat. So. Looking, I'm going to try and compile these after our event today as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, um, my brief answer to that is through events such as this. So that's a great way to connect people who, you know, may not be in the same country or may not be from the same uh, scene of activism. Mm -hmm. so. My response is I that wish. we need to, Please. oh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. Yeah, like you're saying, we need to meet other activists, but when we meet other activists, we also need to create an environment where we talk about things that are not activism because we also need to relax and think about other things. So uh, I think Mid2 Asians had some workshops, for example, with creative writing and art therapy, which I think are such great initiatives and I wish I could join also in person. Um, because yeah, we need to take time off sometime. Sure. Why don't we? Hopefully, we'll meet in person with spicy food and cats. Maybe next time, we really need that. And I think yeah, art would be amazing way to connect. And we don't have any. We don't need any language to express that. And yeah, that's amazing way to do. And you know, I think it's it's con a bit of going back to the last question but i personally still struggle with um online how to use you know um social network how i mean this is amazing part of using internet but after i've been facing so many threats in daily basis i had my cell phone but i can't check my email anymore 
can't do anything. And I'm just, even from my, you know, best friend text message, I, I'm always scared to open it. So I have to do whenever I feel okay. And it's not going to, it doesn't happen all the time. So I don't know how to name it, how I, if it, what's going on in me, because it's quite, it's been a long time. And maybe I need a therapist. I think I do. But I also, again, I guess I'm tired speaking about what's, what's happening to me. And I don't know who to be perfect to talk to because I don't think I can do it in, in Japanese. But I need someone who understands Japanese culture. And so, but this is like a huge selfie session. So thank you so much. But I am still find, trying to find a way how to balance myself online and being um, public as well because I need to protect myself as well. And I can't just do that um, by myself. And I don't know how to balance that actually. Mm. So, so I yeah, have... maybe starting having two cell phones. Like yeah. you said, yeah, maybe. <laughs> and knowing the difference between being accessible online and using online resources. Because mm -hmm. pe people reaching you is different to you reaching out. And I think for me, that's what is important about this Zoom session today. It's a very closely guarded call and, uh, you know, it's password protected. And people in the chat all had to... Uh, been given information beforehand on how to engage with us and I think that's one important way of us protecting each other. Mm. Yeah if I can make also practical recommendation it's also to really separate your social media accounts so for example I have an Instagram account that is private and I will only share with people I consider to be friends and then I have a public facing Instagram account where anybody can reach me but I will also not check it out often because I cannot request respond to everybody's um like request for help or advice and to make that clear on the profile to say work related inquiries may take x number of days to respond and also for your email to have a separate encrypted email service like proton mail that only you and trusted people will use mm -hmm. and two-factor authentication <laughs> yes <laughs> Is uh, oh you're speaking my love language. Um, uh, digital security is so important. And, uh, it's also very yeah. I, I love Proton Mail too. So um, yeah, uh, we have one more question um, before we start to wind down. Um, what does protest mean to you? Say again, please. What does protest mean to you? The word protest, protest, the idea of protest. For me personally, it was showing what I believe in. I didn't even know that was uh, what I'm speaking was legal or political or whatever. I mean, it's everything, but. Um, in the end of the day, I have to believe in what I'm speaking. So, um, I mean, um, so for me writing and, you know, having press conference was protesting because I see failure of journalism, legal system, um, uh, in investigational organization and so on. So I had to protest and I had to protect that at the same time I had to be public. So um, for me it was, yeah, really showing what I believe in. That's beautiful. What about yourself, Lily? Um, I think a, a protest for me is just to, sh it's, it's a way to show my anger to the oppressive structures and all this like uh, societal problems and so on. And uh, also to gather up the people who think as I do. I love that, the community again. <laughs> mm. I think protest is about asking questions that are making people uncomfortable in the end because yeah if 
that's also why um, it's very important to not tone police activists to say, why are you being such an angry feminist? Mm -hmm. Well, aren't you angry that women are facing violence? Then you're a psychopath. I'm sorry. <laughs> you have to be angry at those things because that's, a, that's the correct human emotion to have, to injustice facing people who have done nothing. Mm. And it's so validating to know that that is the correct human emotion to have and that we're feeling these pain or this anguish or, or we're being triggered by something because it is triggering. It is. Yeah. And yeah. Um, yeah, that's very interesting. And that's something we have to work on, especially as uh, people who are brought up as women and Asian women because we are told you should be very nice to everybody. Don't make anybody uncomfortable. Respect them. Well, who's respecting me? I have to respect myself too. Mm. Mm. I feel um, there's a, a very powerful energy in this in this Zoom room today. And um, before we leave, um, how how are you going to wind down now that we've had this this conversation, each of you? What's your what's your post event routine? For me, I'm gonna make a cup of uh, herbal tea and uh, chase my cat around the living room. So she, she <laughs> she's been trying to play with me for the last hour. <laughs> I usually make a doodle on my iPad. <laughs> Still be your faces and things you have said that inspire me. <laughs> Oh, I that think sounds lovely. Yeah. So I'll have TJ chasing the cat, have Fury <laughs> with the wine. <laughs> and Lily, what are you going to do? I'll love to see that. <laughs> yeah, me too. I would love to see that. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, before, so before we head, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody for engaging so mindfully with these questions and with these thoughts. And uh, thank you, Lily, Gia, Shuri, for coming today. And for all the participants, your questions are just fantastic. And uh, for those that we didn't answer, just know it wasn't because they weren't great questions. We just uh, ran out of time. It was uh, amazing to read them. And we will try and answer them in different ways after this event too. And so, uh, so yeah, thank you everybody so much for coming. If there are any parting thoughts beforehand, you let me know. Otherwise. I'm going to onsen after this. Oh! I'm actually in onsen play, so. It's the best I'm place. treating myself after the verdict, yes. And I, that part, I love being in Japan. But I, I think um, Hot Bus has been helping me, so. Please take care of yourself. I know listening all of this, you are using a lot of energy than you think. So take care of yourself, treat yourself. And yeah, thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to e-meet. It's great. Yeah. Uh, let there be many more. Openly, openly. Okay. I also want to, uh, before we finish, I also want to uh, thank Siori that she wrote this amazing book and uh, I, uh, I couldn't stop reading when I first started it, the book because it just was so um, strong and I, yeah, it's, the content was uh, quite strong for me, but uh, I couldn't really stop. I had to finish at once and it was really amazing. I just want to thank you again. <laughs> Thank you yeah. for saying that. Thank yeah. you. It also inspired the work at Asian Voices Europe because you analyze the question and what the political and legal systems are responsible for because individual problems have to be extended into structural problems for us to be able to tackle it. Whereas people would say, it's your personal problem. And that's not true. Oh, I feel so empowered. I'm so happy to have you in this world. <laughs> Thank you. This is very inspiring. Thank it's beautiful you. to see everybody's words reaching each other. And so I'm going to wish you all a good evening, a good morning, good afternoon. And uh, I look forward to the next time we get to get together again and have more powerful conversations. And uh, yeah, look after yourselves also.